Hey guys, it's Monica with the Business of Bridal Sewing podcast. Um, I am, uh, gosh, I try not to sound like a broken record here on the podcast, but you guys are not going to be surprised when I say that I'm so excited for today's episode. So today we are talking all about marketing. Um, specifically this episode, this is our second in the marketing series of three. This one's talking all about branding. Um, you guys know me. I am an optimistic entrepreneur. I am hopeful. I am happy. I am a big believer in the magic that exists in the world around us and like all the magic and wonderful things and beautiful things that we can create in our lives and our businesses. And this episode is so full of that magic. Um, We talked a lot about that magic in our episode about mission statements and our work there that we did with our mission statements. Um, So if a mission statement is where that dream kind of begins, where we start to really encapsulate the vision of that big dream of the beauty that we want to create in our businesses, then branding is where that vision that starts in the mission statement, that branding is where it actually starts to, like where the rubber starts to meet the road, where we actually start to build those beautiful things, build those experiences with our customers and like really create that vision where it comes to life. So if you haven't already listened to the episodes on mission statements for sure you're going to want to have a mission statement we are going to pull so heavily from all of the work that we did in our mission statements we're also going to build on the foundation that we made in our work on market research um, specifically all about our target market brides what she values where she goes to find information everything that she needs like what what she wants out of her wedding dress and what kind of wedding dresses she will pick in all of that research about our target market. So um, if you need to hit pause to go back and listen to those episodes or kind of finish up some of your homework from those episodes, then we will be right here waiting for you when you come back. Did you guys totally start to sing a song in your head? Because I totally started to sing a song in my head. (laughs) Um, Anyways, um, or if you're like me and you kind of want to see like where you're headed with things, um, especially when you're trying to slog through like all of the hard work of mission statements and market research, because yes, it can be hard at times, then totally to listen to this branding episode so that you can kind of get the vision of how we're going to use those things to really take action, to really create the kind of businesses that we want to have. So Um, In our last little mini episode, we kind of did like a little bit of a recap of marketing and the different terms and how we define them and really the different kind of path that we're going to take when we're doing our work in marketing. Um, So for us, we defined branding as the message that we're communicating. So we're going to go backwards for a second and we're going to talk about effective marketing. Um, In our last episode, we defined effective marketing as communicating the right message to the right target market in a way that builds trust with them and inspires them to take action with the goal of building a business relationship. So that's like a lot of words. So I'm gonna repeat it and then we're gonna break it down. Effective marketing communicates the right message to the right client in a way that inspires them to take action with the goal of building a business relationship. So what that means for us is that we need to be communicating the right message about who we are and who our clients are and what their experience is going to be with us. And we need to communicate that message specifically to our target market. Um, We can, I mean, branding is really just a a mode of communication. So we can talk all day long, but if we're not talking to the right people or we're not sending the right message, all of our efforts of communication are going to fail. So that's especially to in branding. We need to be talking to the right client who is our target market. We're going to pull very heavily from our market research for that. And we need to communicate the right message. And we need to do so in a way that's inspiring and actionable, which we'll talk a little bit about in our next episode, which is all about advertising. So if branding is the message that we are communicating, then advertising is the tools or the methods or the modes that we use to communicate that message. So we'll talk about actionable and, you know, that kind of part in our advertising episode. But for today, branding is the message, right? So when we're talking about marketing, There are just so many wonderful books about business and books about marketing. 
there are so many uh, gurus and accounts and professionals and experts all about branding, all about marketing on Instagram and Pinterest. Sorry, I said that wrong. Um, Instagram and Pinterest. Maybe I'll just start calling both of them Pinstagram. Just smash them up together. <laughs> um, anyway, so there are there's a lot of information. Um, and one of the ways that we as humans kind of uh, learn really well and kind of be able to process information is through kind of patterns. So each different branding professional has their own kind of branding strategy or their kind of formulas that you fill in, um, different kind of like fill in the blanks that you can use to like really get your, to have it be like really easy and really actionable to be able to build your branding. Um, so we're going to kind of talk about one of those. So a lot of them are kind of um, spins off of or different iterations of like the, the most basic branding message formula, which is you plus your client plus your client's problem plus how you're going to solve it for them. So again, who you are, who your client is, what problem your client has, and how working with you or using your product or service is going to you know solve that problem that they have. So a really clear example of this, it don't in any way think that I'm, I'm suggesting that you do this, <laughs> but a really clear example of this kind of format, this formula is in infomercials. So um, please hearken back to a specific 90s sitcom that we all know and love of a group of six friends that live, you know, with and near each other. Um, and there is an episode where one of the friends is acting in a in an infomercial and it's all about um, a device that is used to like as a spout for milk cartons um so it's kind of making fun of that infomercial format but it's easy to make fun of because it's so true and they use it all of the time but they use it all the time because it works so here's what that formula is the first thing that you do is you build some sort of trust so you have a um a host who is like trustworthy or some sort of expert or is charismatic or sometimes they build that trust by kind of formatting the show as some sort of news clip or informational program or something like that so you can build trust with your clients so it's telling like who you are and they do so also by speaking directly to either usually there's like a live audience and so they're speaking directly to potential customers and so you are also kind of like watching this thing and so you can kind of feel like you're in the audience so they're speaking directly to you or they might just drop the fourth wall usually they do drop the fourth wall altogether and speak directly to the viewers at home um so that's you know they've set up you them they've set up you and then they very clearly set up your problem so I don't know why, but they're often about like kitchen gadgets or cleaning gadgets. So they'll switch over from color into black and white and they'll show you all the messes that are like lying around your house and all of these people who kind of look like doofuses who can't do regular things like open a milk curtain <laughs> and like just are splashing things everywhere and your vacuum can't pick it up and oh my goodness, the wine spilled everywhere, all of those things. So what they're doing before they introduce their product is they're clearly defining the problem set. They're clearly like outlining exactly what the problem is, what the parameters of that problem are, and basically like creating like an outline of this, this problem that they're going to have. And then they introduce the product, which is going to solve that problem because the problem was set up specifically matching the characteristics of the product. So if your product, you know, rotates at a certain speed, then they're going to be like, oh, all of these vacuums don't rotate fast enough to pick up this thing in the problem so that when the product is introduced, it exactly matches the outline of that problem to solve all your worries and all your woes. They convince you of its value at a specific price, and then they kind of cut that price in half, or they send you two instead of one, or there's free shipping, or like different things like that, just to make it even more of a value so that that value is irresistible. And they tell you 150,000 times exactly what the phone number is or the website is to be able to get this product. Even if you're not listening to an infomercial, even if it is just on in the background while you are visiting great grandma and grandpa, like you will know the number. You will not know where the number is. You haven't been watching the infomercial. You don't know what it means, but you will know the number because they repeat it so often. So that's like the basic 
classic example, like super repetitive. It is used all the time because it is kind of like the base off of which all branding and marketing messages are built. Again, it's setting up who you are, who your client is, what your client's problem is, and how the goods or services that you offer are going to solve that problem. So we can relate that really easily to bridal sewing. Um, if we're doing custom design work, we can very easily say, you know, I'm a designer, my client is a bride, they need a wedding dress, and I'm going to create a custom wedding dress for them. Or if we're talking about alterations, it's very easy to say I'm a bridal alteration specialist, my client is a bride, the problem she has is that her dress doesn't fit her and I'm gonna solve her problem by doing her alterations and stitching it up so that it fits her beautifully, right? That's the very basic. That is kind of like the basis. That's pretty easy to get to, but a lot of people stop there. Um, so what we're gonna do for us, because we don't want basic branding, we don't want a basic purpose. We don't want like, clear, cut and dry, generic, black and white, photocopied things, because that's not the kind of lives we want to live. Um, that's not the kind of businesses we want to build. We want to build businesses that are full of like color and texture. And so we're going to layer a lot of color and beauty and authenticity into our branding message. So for us, we're going to kind of translate this all into us, not just for bridal sewing, but into fabulous, wonderful, amazing businesses, because you know that I can't do anything without chalking it full of magic. For us and our magic, wonderful businesses, the elements of good branding are going to include, number one, who you are, which, I mean, I'm going to echo myself here, I'm going to be a little parrot, um, is literally your mission statement. Your mission statement states who you are and what you do. It states your values. It states all of the things that are both common to you in the industry and also the things that are unique to you within your industry as well. The things that really make you who you are. So you have all of that work done in your mission statement. That's why we're going to pull really heavily and why we need that mission statement completed. So that is the first element of good branding. The second element of good branding for us is who our target market is. This is, you know, who we're talking to. Um, so again, as much detail and color and beauty that we need from our mission statement when we're describing us, we need just as much texture, we need just as much color, we need just as much detail and information about our target market bride. Now, just as we talked about when we were talking about market research, like don't worry about going into too much detail. Don't worry about narrowing it down too far because we are not gonna turn away brides who don't fit our exact definition of who our target market is. But the more specific we can get with our target market, the more direction and clarity we can get with our branding message and the more effective advertising we will be able to do. We will be able to have our message reach more of the kinds of clients that we want to work with, with less advertising resources. We'll talk all about that in the next episode, but clarity, color, and detail when you are listing out for our good branding, who you are talking to, who your target market bride is. So we have who we are from a mission statement. We have who our target market is from our research. Um, in the standard kind of, you know, the basic formula, the next thing would be what problem we're going to solve for our brides. Um, that's going to be kind of embedded a little bit, right? So um, it's going to be kind of, we're going to, we're just going to assume that we're talking about bridal sewing. We can take that for it. We can take advantage of the fact that our brides are already going to like know that we do bridal sewing. Um, obviously, if they've contacted or reached us or found our information, like it's very easy to kind of do that thing. As long as they know they're contacting a seamstress, like that's kind of covered for us. So what her problem is, is going to be kind of embedded into our branding, but not necessarily explicitly stated. What is going to be very clear, very detailed and very explicitly stated is what, this is the third one, this is the most important, what everything's leading up to. This element of good branding is what your relationship with her is going to be, what her relationship with you is going to be, and what her experience with you is going to be like. That is 
kind of the process of her having a problem and you solving the problem, that's where that problem, that need that we're going to fill is embedded. But we're not just gonna talk about how we're gonna solve her problem. We are going to give her a very clear vision on what our relationship is going to be like, what our business relationship is gonna be like, and what her experience is gonna be like as we work with her to get her that fabulous fit, what the outcome's gonna be, what her experience is gonna be like. So just to recap, the elements of good branding for us are who we are, who our target market is, and what her relationship and experience with us is gonna be like. So everything that we do in branding, that is the message. We want to be communicating. If you think about like all the different ways that you would use branding, like in your advertising methods, like in your mission statement, all of that stuff, this message, the reason why it's so important is because that is what matters to the bride. Um, like it's pretty easy for us to kind of oversimplify the way that consumers make decisions. Um, it's really easy for us to kind of like approach it in a rational way, thinking that all of our clients make super rational decisions based on really quantifiable um, characteristics of a good or service. What I mean by that is like, it would be really easy for us, like we overemphasize the role that a bride's budget plays in her decisions. Um, it does play a big part, but it's not, the only thing that a bride thinks about and it certainly often is not the number one thing that a bride thinks about so if you hearken back to our episode where we talked about um adjusting your prices towards your target market we talked a lot about your target market and what their different values and what their different needs are and it's pretty easy to see how budget which is numbers it's really quantifiable it's kind of like cold hard facts like Brides often have like a finite amount of resources to be able to do this decision with. It's very easy to see how that like plays a part in the decision making process, but people don't actually use that as much as we think they do. Often people want to have a fabulous experience. Our brides want to know that they're working with somebody who is really experienced, so they want to feel safe. They want their experience to be encouraging. They want to feel safe to be themselves. They want their to feel safe like leaving their dress with you. They want to feel confident that that outcome is going to be exactly what they think they are. They're thinking about the entire experience of alterations and they're thinking emotionally about it. They're thinking about how they want that experience to go. It doesn't matter how inexpensive you are. It doesn't matter if you are the least expensive bridal sewing professional that is available to this bride, she will not entrust you with her dress if she does not have confidence that it's going to come out how she wants it to. So again, people are willing to pay more than they were expecting to or whether they budgeted. If they get that value, if they get that safety, if they get that wonderful, beautiful experience, they are willing to change their budget, but they are not willing to change their expectation of quality. So that is why your relationship with your brides and her experience, like being able to communicate to her what her experience is going to be like is so, so important. So there's a quote by Seth Godin, at least Pinterest tells me it's by Seth Godin. And don't we all just believe everything that's on Pinterest? <laughs> I know I do, especially if it's like in pretty topography, like pretty colors, and it has beautiful visual branding, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, anyway, so this quote by Seth Godin says that um, people don't purchase goods and services. They purchase um, relations, magic, and stories. Actually, I think I switched that up. I think if people do not buy goods and services, they buy relations, stories, and magic. So you obviously are already here for the magic. I'm already here for the magic. Like, we totally believe in all of those things. At least I totally do. Um but I think we underestimate the value of storytelling when we're doing our branding. So the elements of good branding, who you are, who your target market is, and what their experience or their relationship is gonna be like with you, that's a story. It involves two characters. It involves you and her, and the story is what her experience is gonna be like, what the plot is, like how things are gonna go with you, and what emotionally that journey and that relationship is gonna feel like. Branding is all about storytelling. And storytelling is a method of communication that really resonates with our brides because she's planning a wedding. 
And what is a wedding? Other than a story. She's telling the love story of her and her fiance, both, you know, in the past, how they came together, who they are as characters, like what their hobbies are, how they relate to each other, their relationship, and what their hopes and dreams are for the future. That is the story that she's telling. So if we think about a wedding as a story, or let's say as like a theatrical production, there is a venue, there's flowers, there's decorations, there's a complete scenic design where the scene, which is this wedding, the event, the experience that she's creating for her loved ones and her guests, this scene is going to take place. Our part in that theatrical production is as a costume designer. We are, you know, maybe not designer, but we're working on the costuming kind of effort. She is telling the story of who she is and how she feels in her relationship with her fiance through her wedding dress. The wedding dress alterations process and especially the custom design creation process is a creative method of storytelling through wedding dresses or wedding ensembles or cute little pantsuits or jumpers or like whatever we're doing, <laughs> whatever we're creating for her, right? So we can, the reason why that's so important to her is because her wedding is all about emotion. It's all about love. It's all about the story. It's all about who she is. She's designing this story and this dream of who she is and who she's going to be and what her family is going to be like with her fiance, right? So that's important to her. And in the ways that that is important to her, our branding needs to match that value that she puts. Our branding needs to include the story. And again, I'm going to be so repetitive about this. You're going to be able to chant it with me, just like you can chant the phone number of an infomercial. The story is who you are, who your bride is, and what her experience is going to be like with you. That's what the story is. Those are the elements of good branding. That's all the branding is, is a message. And that message is who you are, who your bride is, and what her relationship and her experience is going to be like with you. How she looks on her wedding day is going to directly affect how she feels on her wedding day. It's going to directly affect her experience of her wedding day, and it's going to directly affect all of the memories that she has and the story that she tells about her wedding day, literally for the rest of her life, right? So this method of storytelling, it's super important because it's one of the number one ways that we as humans um, like learn from each other is through hearing and telling stories. It's one of the number one ways that we process our thoughts and emotions by telling other people the stories of our lives. It builds connection, it builds community, it builds authenticity and trust into our relationships. And for us specifically, our branding, our message, our storytelling through our branding is going to give our brides permission to be able to engage in this process in the way that we want her to. So it is our branding, our message is going to invite and be appealing to the specific kind of brides that we work with. And it's going to invite her into that process and give her permission to engage in that process in a way that is authentic to her because we're gonna be authentic about ourselves. That's gonna resonate with her. If what we want out of this relationship and the way that we're describing this relationship doesn't match what she wants, she's not gonna to respond to our branding which is totally fine because she may not be our target market, right? So if we want more of the kind of business that we want, we need our branding to be specific. We need it to be colorful. We need it to be detailed and we need it for sure to tell the story of who we are, who our bride is and what her experience is going to be like with us. Okay. I think I've repeated that enough. I'm probably going to repeat it 59,000 times more, but let's get down to the nuts and bolts of how we do this. I'm so excited. Okay. So branding, like all communication, because branding is, you know, communicating a message, like all communication, um, it can be expressed through a variety of mediums. Like if you're having a conversation with someone, you're communicating verbally and non-verbally. The same is true with branding. Um, although when you think of branding, probably the first thing that pops in your head is a logo, which is awesome. Logo kind of falls into the, mo the medium of visual communication which is very, very important for creative people like us, people who are designing a visual environment, people who are storytelling. Visual branding is such a huge part of our branding message. 
Now it can be easy to think only about the visual branding, so we'll get to the others, but let's talk about visual branding first. All of the design elements in our visual branding need to tell the story. So we should already know what our story is, we should know what our method is, our message is, before we start to like pick colors, before we design a logo and different things like that. If you ha already have any of these visual marketing decisions made, then take a moment to review them and make sure that each of those design elements are telling the story that you want to tell. We, this includes color, this includes texture, detail, shape, all the elements of design, This, which would include for us in visual branding, this would include fonts, this would include motifs, this would include any kind of design element that your bride is going to see. And you are trying to communicate that message, you're trying to tell that story through not words, but visual elements. So I think we all know a little bit about color theory. Um, and how different colors evoke different emotions and kind of different values and different things like that. So I'm gonna give you like a super, kind of like, ob I'm gonna use super obvious examples, but I want you to like kind of dive further into detail and be very thoughtful when you make these decisions. But just off the cuff, like if we're talking about like a business card, let's say your bride has purchased her dress and she's standing at the cash wrap for, you know, signing the contract and everything and your awesome bridal shop, because of course we're gonna work with an awesome bridal shop who has been trained to help their brides know what their next steps are gonna be, um, that sales staff is going to kind of point them towards the direction of a stack of business cards, um, where different business cards for other wedding professionals are gonna be displayed, and she's gonna point out, you know, these two business cards for these two bridal selling professionals and let's say one business card is pink, very common color for bridal. I totally love that though, right? Love it. So one business card is gonna be pink and it's gonna have, let's say like floral motifs and elements on it, right? And then the other business card is going to be, let's say it's cream and it's going to have like gold gilt lettering with like art deco kind of uh, design elements on it, like the lines and the, the stri straight lines and then the curves and, you know, that kind of stuff. So two very distinct kind of uh, visual branding. If this bride only knows what she sees on a business card, she's going to already have a feeling for the kind of person that you are, the kind of vibe that she's going to get from your different, the two different businesses, and she's going to already be gathering clues as to how her relationship is going to be with you. So um, if she's looking at the pink and floral business card, pink is very feminine, it's very soft. Um, florals are very like nature based, um, which could kind of draw to mind to her, whether it's, you know, kind of at the top of her thought process or whether it's more like subtle and subconscious. Um, that kind of branding is going to lead her towards expecting more of kind of like an intimate kind of um, nurturing relationship with her bridal sewing professional. So the business card that's like cream and gold and gilt and art deco is going to give more of a value like that gives off kind of more the vibe of like luxe luxury. So she's probably going to expect more of a luxury experience. Um, it may not be as like intimate and welcoming. I wouldn't necessarily say it was going to be cold, but it's going to be like tilted a little more professional than intimate, right? And she's going to have a little bit more of like a professional business relationship with that business to do for her bridal sewing than she would expect to have with the business that has like the pink and floral business card. Both of those are awesome directions to go in. Um, for your visual branding, what you need to do to be able to make those decisions is really make sure that each decision is tied back to your mission statement. So if one of your values in your mission statement is luxury, then gold all the way, right? Not say, I mean, it's going to have like more of a clear, crisp, graphic design feel, right? If your value, um, if one of your values from your mission statement is to build rapport through kind of like more intimate and open communication um, and different things like that, then definitely lean into the kind of 
tones and the kind of motifs that are going to um, express that openness and that welcomeness and that intimacy. So I like you guys can extrapolate that onto all the different design elements. You can talk, th think that through with your color. You can think that through with your motifs, with your shapes. Think that through with your fonts, whether your your combination of fonts that you want to do. And if you want some homework for your visual branding, um, this is totally a fun one. If you hop onto Pinterest, you can search for a template, like a visual branding template or some sort of combination of keywords that are like that. <laughs> I don't know exactly what they're called, but they're basically um, templates where you can like fill in, they have like spots for different colors and you can actually find the exact color code, like the digital color code. So it's like a hashtag with like numbers and letters behind it. So that when you're doing your graphic design for your business cards or like your thank you postcards that you mail out after each bride or whatever you're doing, you can use exactly the same color of pink or exactly the same color of teal um, on all of your different design elements. And so you can like pick font combinations, you can design logos, you can have different kinds of logos. So you can have one that's like horizontal orientation, one that's vertical orientation, definitely design a like a profile icon. So like on Instagram, there's like the little circle where normally like a profile picture would go. But if you're a business, a lot of businesses have like a small circular version of their logo that you can see even when it's like itty bitty tiny. So you can kind of create those like branding guidelines and you can build your branding assets like your logo and your colors and things like that. So when you go to do, um, when you go to set up your visual merchandising or later down the road, if you are kind of like rebuilding a website or different things like that, you already have those assets available. You've already made all of those decisions and you know that the decisions you're gonna make in this new advertising mode is going to match all the visual advertising that you've had in the past. So you can create visual marketing guidelines for yourself, visual branding guidelines for yourself, and you can build a cache of visual um, graphic design assets so that when you are putting things together, those are readily accessible. Those are kind of like already done and you can piece them into your new advertising methods. So that's all about visual communication. Next, we're gonna talk about verbal communication. So if you're talking like in a conversation, obviously verbal communication is the actual words that you say. So for us, we're gonna kind of lump in there together, not just the words that we say, to, the words that we use to tell our story, but also like our ad copy. So that's gonna be all of the text that we have on, on our website and on our business cards and all the words that we use. So when we're thinking about the words that we use, and this can be something that you may not have noticed has an effect on your relationships with your clients, but absolutely, a thousand percent does. Um, the words that we use each have their own denotation and connotation. So, sorry, I'm an English geek. Um, so a denotation is like the definition of the word, like the literal meaning of the word. And then the connotation is like the extra meaning that that word or term has accumulated, like the the extra, like the value that people place on that word or how to use it, like the hidden meaning behind it. So all of the extra meaning that that word carries, right? So we've already talked on the podcast about um, the different terms that we use to describe ourselves as bridal sewing professionals, whether we call ourselves seamstresses or tailors or alteration specialists, sewists, designers, each of those, um, each of those terms is going to have a different connotation. They all might be very similar in their denotation, but there might be subtle differences in their definition. For example, um, a sewist can be anyone who sews anything, right? Of any gender, it's gender neutral, but it's also very open-ended, right? In contrast to that, if you are a bridal alterations specialist, then, you know, that in the definition of that term um, states that you do alterations to ready-made garments. That's the kind of sewing that you do and that you do that only with bridal or that you specialize in doing that with bridal gowns. So if you're going to compare sewist to bridal alterations specialist, 
Again, there's not one that's better than another. They have different denotations. They have different connotations. If you um, make money doing all different kinds of sewing, you may want a more general term like sewist. If you are doing specifically only bridal alterations and you want to be able to communicate that to potential clients, um, perhaps you're like me and I don't do any other alterations besides wedding related alterations, feet like dress related alterations. So only bridal, only formal. So I put that in all of my branding. I put that in my Google listing and everything like that, um, that I create custom, like I'm a custom dressmaker and a bridal alterations specialist because I clearly specialize in bridal alterations. You get it, you know, you can see the difference of the definitions of each of those different terms, but they're also going to carry different connotations as well. Um, some terms are going to have kind of more just like a general sewing vibe to them, which can include professionals. It can also include hobbyists. It can include people who have like a very specific niche like cosplay, or it can include people who sew, like do anything with a sewing machine, right? Some terms are very general, some terms are very specific, um, but the connotation is kind of like the values that we place on those terms. For example, I love the turn towards gender neutral um, definitions for ourselves, love that. Um, I love that women seamstresses are beginning to call themselves tailors. I love that for a couple of reasons because I feel that the term tailor has more of a professional connotation than a seamstress. And this has like, there's like a whole soapbox I can get on about gender is, is things. Um, one of which is the fact that women who sew for money often are looked at as doing these kind of things as a hobby. But if men sew for money, then it's automatically seen as a profession, right? So there's a little bit of a connotation there. I love the professionalism of the term tailor. Me personally, because of my experience, because everyone's gonna interpret different words through their own viewpoints and through their own experiences. I have experience in costume design and in apparel design um, that, so the term tailor carries with it for me a connotation uh, like that heavily leans towards menswear, like creating from scratch menswear or menswear alterations. So because I am, because that word has that connotation for me and that doesn't match the story that I'm telling about myself, I don't use the term tailor, but for me, but that doesn't mean that that's not like perfect for you. Everyone is going to make different choices. <laughs> Everyone's going to use different words. I love all of the words that are spoken with respect to other people, right? Um, that's why I kind of love the turn towards gender neutral things because it's opening up like respect and it's opening up space for anyone who knows how to sew, no matter what their gender identity is. So I love that. Um, I love that opening up of respect, but I also personally love the feminine legacy that I carry of the all the women in my family um, for, you know, different generations that skipped a generation, but all of the women, like me and all my sisters, we sew for a living in different aspects and both of my grandmas sewed and one of them specifically, she fed her kids as a single mother um, on her work sewing. So I cherish that femininity. So I'm probably like, give it a couple years and I'll probably be unpolitically correct by calling myself a seamstress, but I'm just gonna be an old fashioned person and kind of hold out, hold on to that term just for a little while longer <laughs> for myself because I'm selfish that way. <laughs> okay, anyways, so, when we're thinking about the words that we use to tell our story and describe ourselves, um, all of the words that we choose kind of have meaning. Um, I'll give you another example. I'll try not to be long-winded about it, but it's another soapbox issue <laughs> that I like to get on. So um, I have been practicing body positive language in the bridal industry for a couple of decades. Has it been that long? Oh my gosh. It's almost been two decades, <laughs> yikes. Anyways, so just the fact that I can say that it's been almost two decades um, makes me think that probably some of the words and terms I use, um, it, I've been doing it long enough that they're probably outdated by now. So if I use any words that are 
outdated or that carry different connotations in the modern world than they did when I learned of them or chose them, then uh, please let me know. Kindly, with respect, in the comments, in an instant message, whichever. So, um, but I've been practicing body inclusivity and body positivity in selling wedding dresses and in doing alterations and in designing wedding dresses for a long time because that's very important to me. So I have a couple of specific terms that I use. Um, I've talked about this before, but like I don't say, like when I'm talking to a, a bride about her body fluctuations, I don't talk to her about her weight because how much a bride weighs in a wedding dress has absolutely no bearing on my work. What changes and matters to my work is her measurement, her shape, her physique, that kind of stuff. So I will use those terms. I also, again, we've talked about this before, I have built structure into my business to be able to normalize body fluctuations and to allow within my process the room to be able to handle those up to a certain extent. And in my own personal language and in my own personal like mission statement and how this comes through and in my bride's experience with me and the way that I tell the story about who I am and who my brides are and what their experiences are going to be with me, um, I, I personally go a little bit beyond every bride is beautiful no matter what her body shape is. Um, I think that's like a beautiful message to share, but I want every bride to feel beautiful in her body, not um, without regard to her body. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I want everyone to feel beautiful, but I don't want them to feel beautiful by disregarding what their body shape is. I want them to feel like their body shape, which is so much so so heavily and specifically tied to like our identity and our personal value that we give ourselves I want them to feel like their body and their shape is beautiful and so we'll talk like that comes through in all the decisions that we make on what to address with her dress and the different options that she has to be able to address the things that she wants to change in her dress um it specifically changes her experience with me it changes her experience that she has with her guests because her guests are educated and given the vocabulary to be able to speak to her in that way as well. So, you know, I'm totally open to moms and bridesmaids pointing out things that they think a bride will want to know, but in me using specific words, they have those words, they have the vocabulary to be able to say those things to a bride in a way that is uplifting to her rather than that tears her down. So that totally changes her experience just by changing the different words that we use. Um, so that's very important. If you want to do some homework on that and you are just kind of like, I have not ever thought about the words that I use, <laughs> um, two little homework things that you can do. The first one is just to think about all the, the words that we say over and over and over and over again, or the phrases that we use to explain things over and over again, or the stories that we tell our clients over and over and over again. And look at, start with those words and say, like, ask yourself, what story are, are these words telling my bride about her experience and about who I am and about who she is? And see if that matches your branding. See if that matches the message you want to tell your bride. See if that matches your mission statement, right? Um, if they don't, then kind of craft some new ways to say things. If they do match that message, then write those down because you want to actually... You can have a whole style guide about how to talk, to how to infuse your branding message into everything you say. So when I am talking about a style guide, it's like a, it's a journalism term, and I hope that I'm using it right, but it's basically where if you're an entity or a business or like a church or like any sort of group, um, a style guide is something that's written by you that you can share with journalists and media outlets so that they can be educated and understand how you want to be addressed and how you want your identity to be described. So you're basically educating them on what like the, the words and the way to speak about your identity and your community in a way that is respectful, that you feel is respectful to you, right? So we're doing that, but we're basically doing that for ourselves. We're writing the message for ourselves so that we know the words and terms to use that help build our identity that we have in our branding message, that help 
speak with respect to our target market and that help build that community between you and the bride that build that relationship, build that experience. So if you're wondering exactly how to do that, um, you could even go as far as to literally write down the story that you're telling. Describe who you are. Describe how your bride is. Describe the experience and the emotion that you want her to have as she works with you. Describe your values. Describe how that's going to flow and how you would like your brides to respond. And in writing all of that out, you can pull out terms and words that you can use that are really going to enhance your branding message in all of your interactions with your bride, both when you're speaking with your bride and also in your text copy on your website and all your printed materials and your visual merchandising and everything like that. So we've talked about visually branding. We've talked about um, the way that we brand through the words that we use, which I'm going to call verbally, even though part of it's verbal and part of it's not verbal. Um, so now we're going to talk about kind of like nonverbal. So this is kind of like all the extra stuff. This is like everything that's not included in visual merchandising, which is kind of like the visual branding that we have. Anything that doesn't have specific words attached to it. Anything else that is going to tell the story or affect the experience that your bride is gonna have with you. So this includes um, the atmosphere that she has when she is working with you. Um, it includes the environmental design, so like the interior design of your fitting space, um, whether it's kind of like cluttered and creative and like a little bit wild, or whether it's um, super clean and modern and like efficient, like whether it's bright and bold or whether it's kind of like neutral and clean lines, like all of those different elements, just like visual branding does, all of those visual elements are going to kind of create a mood and atmosphere and it's going to create the scene, the, set, the setting of the scene in which she's going to have her interactions with you. So you can think about, for example, how your interior design matches your visual branding. So if your visual branding includes, um, we'll go back to like the art deco gold thing. Um, if your visual branding includes a lot of white and gold, perhaps you want to design your fitting space to include, you know, gold metal finishes and just clean white walls or upholstery. If you have a specific color that is in your visual branding, maybe you want to include that into your interior, interior design. Maybe you want to include, you know, uh, floral decorations or floral motifs if that's kind of included in your visual merchandising. One of the way that this is really beneficial is um, when you're posting on social media, if you're posting before and afters or photos of your studio or dresses in your studio or brides in your studio, um, on your social media, those photos are gonna make up the majority of what your clients see visually. So if your interior design matches your visual branding, then you're gonna have a cohesive message through all of those things. If your visual branding is very clean, but your fitting space is very cluttered, those two things are gonna tell kind of two different stories. One might be more than the other, one might match your mission statement or kind of the vibe that you wanna give or kind of the atmosphere, whether you wanna be more, I don't know, clean and calm or whether you wanna be more kind of like a little bit more chaotic and artistic and creative, like whichever fits your vibe, you want that to be evident in your branding so that your brides can choose you knowing that that's going to be the atmosphere, knowing that that's going to be kind of the place where she is going to have this experience. This also includes how you dress, how you carry yourself. Um, I'll not engage in the conversation of the right way to dress or the wrong way to dress because the framing of that conversation <laughs> Like I can't engage in that conversation because the way that conversation is framed, I feel like is flawed. Um, I don't think that there's one right way. I don't think that there's one wrong way. Um, nobody knows your business better than you. So you are going to have a different mission statement. You're going to have a different business setup, and you're going to have different values and you're going to have different clients and you're going to have a different vision of the business that you want to build than anyone else. So, you are probably going to make different decisions in your visual branding, in your in the words that you use, and especially in your nonverbal branding, including how you decorate your space and how you dress. Um, I will just kind of 
for an example, use myself for an example, um, on how you can kind of like check through the decisions that you're making, um, including the decisions that you're making specifically and the decisions that you're making like without thinking about it, kind of like by habit which I find that my dress decisions are sometimes kind of by habit. I end up wearing the same like three outfits every time I do a fitting. They're kind of like my go-tos. So, you know, I, we can kind of look at those and kind of see what that means for me. So I have an in-home studio. Um, in my mission statement, I have kind of twin values of um, having an intimate real know what I mean when I say like intimate and open communication with my brides, um, having a very welcoming feeling so that she feels comfortable asking a bunch of questions and like really like knowing how the process is going to go. And so she can trust me, but she can also feel open, like asking me anything or speaking her opinion with me. Um, but I also have another value that kind of goes along with that. Um, I do want to have close communication with her and intimate communication with her, but I also do want to also present myself as very professional. So because I have my brides come into my in-home studio, the kind of comfort level and intimacy level is totally kind of handled by the fact that she's coming to my home. So when I dress for my fittings, I dress more professionally, right? Because I want her to feel that even though she's coming to my home, that I'm a professional, I'm running a business, a successful business, and that she can trust my professionalism, she can trust my skills and my experience, right? If I was meeting with brides in a more commercial space, um, thinking about myself and the decisions that I would make, I probably would dress more casually if my environment was more kind of cold and commercial because that kind of covers the professionalism angle. And so through my dress, I'm going to come off, you know, I won't go as far as to wear ripped jeans because I'm not of that generation that can look cute wearing ripped jeans. like. I've just come to terms with that, <laughs> that I am the age that I am. <laughs> but I mean, there's plenty of gals who work at, you know, all these different bridal shops that can wear ripped jeans and still look professional and that boggles my mind, but they can totally do it. And I love that they can do it. So I probably wouldn't go that far, but I would probably dress more casual because the environment has changed. And so the way that I want to express the different values in my mission statement will kind of change the, the details of the decisions that I make. So the next point that I want to make, speaking of the awesome, wonderful women who work in the bridal shops that I work with, is that the story that you're telling about who you are and who your brides are, you're not the only one telling that story. That story about who you are is also told by other people besides you. So this can include all of the happy, wonderful brides that you have worked with who are leaving you fabulous reviews and who are also telling everyone that they know and becoming kind of like unofficial brand ambassadors for you, that everyone needs to work with you because you're amazing, because you saved her day, because you made her dress so fantastic, because you are such a pleasure to work with, all of those things. Your past brides, anybody who has worked with you is telling a story about who you are and what other potential brides experience with you would be like. Um, the bridal shops that we build reputations with, either for good or for bad, are also telling a story to their brides, who are also our brides, our potential clients, about who you are and what you do. Uh, for me, those two things overlap. I've told you about my favorite cute little bridal shop and all the women who work there. And any of the women who work there who have been married during my time doing alterations during my relationship that I've had with this shop, I've done their alterations for their dresses. So they're able to speak not only from like a professional stance of this is the seamstress that our bridal shop trusts, but they're also able to speak on a personal level of, you know, how much they love me because I'm adorable and I love them and they trust me. We had a fabulous time working together and I also did fantastic work for them. So just, you know, kind of keep in mind that that other people are also telling your story. So one of the ways that you can use your branding to affect the way that other people tell your story is you can obviously, I would 1000% recommend that you curate positive reviews. So any bride who you've had a good experience with and that you, who you've met her your needs, especially if she tells you wonderful things and compliments you, 
I would for sure give her the link to be able to directly leave a review about you. You can also kind of curate your branding by the way that you talk and you speak with your bridal shop. So that kind of affects the way that they speak with their brides about you. I make no, <laughs> I have no qualms about the fact that I am not the least expensive bridal alteration specialist on the list for this shop. Um, I'm definitely not the most expensive in my area, but I might be the most expensive on their list. But that's okay, because the brides that I wanna work with, I want to work with the brides that have the budget to work with me. So the bridal shop kind of qualifies all of my potential brides by talking them through the list of seamstresses that they have because they are kind of like familiar with what alterations the bride needs. So if she needs something like pretty basic done, or if she is a budget bride, they're gonna send her to somewhere else. So the brides who call me all have heard from the bridal shop that I am not the least expensive, but that I am the best seamstress for what they need in their dress. Which, you know, like can include crazy custom sleeves, it can do like a bodice redesign, whatever it is, they will specifically direct their clients to the seamstress that best fits their need because I have communicated with them my story through my branding and through my conversations with them and the way that I speak about brides. So they know the level of um, caring that their brides are going to get from me. They know my personality, obviously. They also know the level of quality of work that their brides are going to get from me. And they also have a general understanding of what those alterations are going to cost. So I hope by now I have thoroughly ignited your excitement <laughs> for the magic of storytelling through branding, both visually, verbally, non-verbally in all of the different ways. I hope that you can see how all of that kind of dreaming and that kind of vision work that we did in our mission statements, I hope you can see how that is starting to come through in the decisions that we're making and how that's starting to become a reality through our branding. So in our next episode, we will talk all about advertising, which is gonna be the different tools and methods that we're gonna use to communicate that message to our brides. So for sure by next week, you will want to have your message kind of crafted. Um, you'll kind of want to have some guidelines for yourself, um, both as far as like the design elements of your message and your branding, and also kind of like the background story of who you are, who your target market is, and what her experience is going to be like with you. Because if we jump into advertising, like so many of us kind of do when we start a business, without thinking through all of these things, all of our advertising advertising resources are going to be less effective if we're not speaking to the right customers, if we're not sharing the right message, if we're not really communicating what our values are from our mission statement through our branding. So you've got a lot of homework to do, but I hope that it is fun and inspiring and awesome and creative homework that you are just super excited to do because hopefully, like me, you are so alive in the magic that is out there and in the magic that we wanna build in our businesses. So until next time, this is Monica with the Business of Bridal Sewing Podcast and happy stitching.